of Field Research, a global journey, webinar series to mark the retirement of Sir Harry Badishia uh, from University of Cambridge. Today we have uh, two speakers. First is Dr. Shurab Kundu from Tata Steel India. Okay. Okay. Um, so today I'll uh, discuss about the challenges of steel industry to achieve the net neutrality. And uh, as you can see in my screen, uh, in, my, in my presentation, it's uh, Harry standing in, uh, in an artist workshop in Jamshedpur, um, where uh, he visited and uh, he's standing by the side of a sculpture of uh, something which is uh, known as Baul in India. The sculpture is made of steel, of course. And, uh, you know, I always found a little bit similarity between this Baul community in India and Harry. And I've written something else on the screen, so I'll give just five seconds to the audience to, to have, a, have a read on this. Um, thank you very much. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you, all the participants. And I'll start my uh, talk. Uh, you know, the uh, net neutrality, which is an issue now in, in uh, most of part of the world, uh, which is evident from the first graph that I'm showing here, we can see that the amount of CO2 that is being emitted every day, every year, which is about 35 gigatons. And a uh, few of the most polluting countries are also you know, shown over here. Of course, China produces about 28%. United States produces about 15%. India is at, at about 7%. So the problem is real. And there's a lot to be done for all of, by all of us. I'll go come to the Indian context uh, now a little bit. Um, you, you know, the India produces about 2.7 gigatons of CO2 per year. And a lot of that actually comes from the electricity and heat. A lot also comes from the industries, as you can see, the 34%. If you go inside this 34% and try to see how much steel contributes, you, you will see that steel contributes about 8.5% of the total GHG emission of India. So the problem is real for the steel industries and that actually causes a lot of stress uh, for the steel uh, industry to function. In fact, it is the same all over the world. In Europe and in the US, it is already uh, very much there because the stricter uh, environmental norms over there. Now, what is the context of this net neutrality? What is the net neutrality and why it is required? So if you see uh, that the CO2 concentration in atmosphere has increased by more than 45% almost from about 280 ppm to the level of 412 ppm. Uh, since the you know, pre-industrial era, so, which is a huge jump. The average temperature of the earth has already increased by more than one degree. But the IPCC has used uh, different representative concentration pathways to depict the concentration trajectory of greenhouse gases. Um, there are four uh, you know, uh, RCPs, as you can see in the right-hand side. And you can see that RCP 2.6, which talks about keeping the temperature rise below two degrees is something that we need to follow. Now, how to do that? In order to do that, we need to keep the, the CO2 in the atmosphere uh, around 450 ppm only. And it cannot increase more than that. And that 450, we should reach in 2030. And after that, there should be a decline. So the phase beyond 2030, needs to see gradual decrease in the CO2 concentration in the, in the atmosphere. And that can be done by achieving a net zero emission by 2050. So this is a, this is a big task. This is uh, also, you know, actually uh, different COPs has happened. Recently, COP26 has also happened. So, so uh, every, every nation actually came up with, uh, you know, nationally determined contributions or indices. And this is something that we need to follow. So this COP that happened a few, uh, you know, few weeks ago, that talked about the phasing down of the coal. In fact, coal has to be phased out 
uh, in some time. So let us see how this is this can be done in steel industry because steel industry is a coal or coke intensive industry. Now, uh, challenges are many, of course, but the challenges for uh, countries where the steel production is going to increase are even more. So you can see this graph here. It is prepared by the uh, International Energy Agency. Uh, if you see the right hand side graph, which talks about the sustainable development or sustainable uh, you know, solutions, you will see that uh, you know the Chinese production is going to come down in steel production needs to come down. Uh, the EU, EU will remain in the same position. It will not increase. The US will also be not increasing the production. But the country like India will increase it by fourfold. So if that happens, the problem becomes four times difficult actually. Because you need to take care of the extra CO2 that you're going to produce. Whereas in Europe or in the US, you have to take care of what the CO2 being produced now, either to sequester it or reduce it by one way or the other. So uh, we'll just check what are the different ways and means to achieve that. Of course, it's difficult as you can understand from here. Let me give you a context of the, the CO2 problem and how big it is. So the most common way of production or producing steel is uh, to use the blast furnace route. And in the left-hand side, I'm trying to show that what is the input and output would be in order to produce 1 million ton of crude steel. So it would require about 0.34 million ton of coke, about 0.22 million ton of coal. And of course, you need, I don't know which I'm not talking about here. And when you produce 1 million ton of crude steel, you will end up producing 2.5 million ton of CO2. Now, how big is 1 million ton of CO2? So it's like, you know, 1 million ton of CO2 would require about 225,000 Olympic sized swimming pools to store that CO2. And we would require about 2,750 square kilometer of rainforest if we want to absorb that CO2 per year. So it's a task which is not easy. Uh, I'm sorry, this particular slide a bit, uh, a bit incomplete, but I'll just try to explain to uh, all of you that how steel is generally produced all over the world. So the first route is integrated steel making as it is being uh, talked about uh, or as it has been written over here. So the two major input is iron ore and the metallurgical coal. Of course, they go through such certain processing and after that it is fed into a blast furnace which produces liquid iron. That liquid iron is then supplied to a basic oxygen furnace and the steel is produced. After the steel is produced, of course, uh, you know, it is, it is uh, actually cast and then rolled. The other way of producing steel is, uh, which is, uh, you know, written over here as electric steel making, although this is a bit of a misnomer, I'm sorry about it. So there also iron ore is required, which goes through certain agglomeration process. We fed the pellet in the direct for the direct reduction. Then direct reduced iron or DI is produced. These are transferred to electric arc furnaces. And then of course, the liquid steel is produced, goes through continuous casting and rolling. Now, if you just remember these two, let us now try and understand that what is the emission phenomena or what is the emission scenarios in these two different, different routes. Okay, so the first let us discuss about the emissions in the blast furnace route. So as I said earlier as well, that it takes about 0.34 million ton of coal, 0.22 million ton of coal to produce 1 million ton of crude steel, and it produces 2.5 million ton of CO2. Now it can be reduced a little bit if you can inject, uh, let us say, this much of hydrogen in the blast furnace. In that case, you would require slightly less amount of coal. Here it was 0.34 and here it will be 0.30. And you can see that there's a little reduction in the emission. So previously it was 2.5 million ton of CO2 per million ton of crude steel. 
and then it will become 2.3 million ton of CO2 per million ton of food. So, this is not really taking us to net neutrality, right? Because this is a little reduction here. Then, what is the next step? The other way, as I was discussing of about the DRI route, there, in order to produce 1 million ton of crude steel, you would require about 10.9 million MMBTU of natural gas. And when you uh, make the DRI and you know, pass it through the electric arc furnace, etc., you would only produce about 1.56 million ton of CO2. Previously, if you just recall, it was, uh, it was about 2.5 or 2.3. So there is a reduction here. Now, the great thing about this particular process is that in this case, you can replace this natural gas completely with hydrogen. So to produce 1 million ton of fruit steel through this route, and if you have enough hydrogen, of course, green hydrogen, then you require about 65,000 uh, tons of hydrogen, and you produce 1 million ton of fruit steel, and you actually end up in giving zero emission. So this is one way I think uh, the world is moving towards. And as you can see, uh, we'll see that how this is possible. So in this graph, we are trying to show the different ways of, uh, of iron production. In the x-axis, we are uh, putting the amount of hydrogen that process can take. In the y-axis, we are showing the uh, CO2 emission. And uh, you know the, uh, the TRL readiness or technology readiness level is uh, depicted with these colors. So you can see there are established processes which are here in the in the top uh, left corner corex finex blast furnace hyzerna etc can take little hydrogen actually less than between 5 to 20 percent as a result the emission is also high but if we go for dri which is given in these two brackets these are the two name of the two companies or two technologies then you can actually use higher amount of hydrogen, which is between 50 to 65%. Your emission is already in the level of 1.5. But the great thing about this, that these two technologies are almost ready to accept hydrogen in the level of 90% or more. If you do that, then your emission comes down to zero here. And this is what uh, is happening right now. A lot of work is going on in the Europe. I am sure many of you have heard of this. Just to check, I, I am sure I'm audible or I'm not. Yes, you are. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Ali. Okay, so what are, what, uh, are different uh, uh, people doing with this particular uh, technology? So hybrid, you have heard of, but they, that's a uh, that's a consortium where you know the uh, the uh, breakthrough technology of iron making is being developed. It's a Swedish consortium where Vattenfall, LKAB, and SSAB is working. Uh, Salcos is a very big program uh, where also uh, people are working on the hydrogen-based DRI, and the ArcelorMittal has also working on the same. Now, if we see. What are the, the different things that we are talking about here? So in this particular slide, if you, I request you to read it from bottom to the top, please. So there is one thing which is carbon direct avoidance. That means that you don't use coal or coke, uh, replace them with maybe natural gas first, and then that natural gas can be replaced with hydrogen. And then you reduce uh, the CO2 emission, which is called uh, CDA or carbon direct avoidance. But as you have seen already, for that, you require green hydrogen. So the challenge would be to produce green hydrogen in great or, or a large quantity. Uh, but that these two would not completely eliminate the hydrogen, why, uh, uh, CO2. Why? Because we will still have a lot of uh, uh, blast furnaces around. Because, you know, the problem there is that the if you if you put a blast furnace in any steel company that is going to be there for more than 40 years and there are many new blast furnaces around the world and for economical uh, reasons we can't really get rid of them all all of them together 
so the other ways of doing this beyond the carbon direct avoidance is the carbon capture sequestration and use so that means that you capture the carbon uh, through certain technologies like say amid based uh, capture uh, you can do that uh, as well uh, with uh, other technologies but uh, not so popular yet then you have to convert that co2 into different products so for instance catalytic based conversion of co2 i'll discuss about it a little bit we would require uh, maybe a little bit of hydrogen to convert uh, this co2 into different hydrocarbons but for all of this the large scale solutions are uh, not so much there and it is also costly we'll discuss about that as well but there is one more uh, way of doing this that is after capture the carbon you sequester it it depends on of course the geography where you live in in europe it is possible but in countries like india it's very difficult so maybe maybe for uh, indian steel industry uh, they have to be you know completely depend on the carbon capture and utilization so we'll discuss about the challenges of all of this uh, together uh, gradually in the next part of the presentation so as i was telling that towards the net uh, carbon neutrality the uh, zero emission from iron making would be essential because most of the carbon is being used there carbon capture and utilization is the second step which is also needed and of course as an enabler you need to produce green hydrogen so two major challenges as i was telling that uh, that there uh, there actually i'm sorry uh, so there has to be a production of economically viable green hydrogen and there has to be technologies for car carbon capture and sequestration or use okay so what are the key factors influencing the adoption of green steel making okay let us go uh, to those one by one so the first is the technical maturity and performance so currently we are at the level of 5 to 7 trl technology readiness level we need to go to 9 but that probably will be bridged soon the cost of the technology or the production is also very important now the current cost difference for hydrogen based dri and ef root of steel making with the bf bof that means blast furnace and basic oxygen furnace steel making is about 300 ton per uh, 300 dollars per uh, ton of crude steel so that is a substantial difference we need to bridge that gap that's the challenge then the cost of uh, low carbon fuel or hydrogen is also something very important so current cost of hydrogen is about 4 to 6 dollar per kg it has to come down to 1 to 1.5 dollars per kg the government policies are important certain policies are already in place in europe and the us the same has to the rest of the world has to follow the suit and the expected carbon tax is about 50 to 100 dollar per ton of co2 we need to see that how much of it comes the existing asset and capex requirement or or the investment is a, is a very big challenge so as i was mentioning that long life of the existing assets that means mostly the blast furnaces is a problem because you can't really get rid of them or get rid of all of these together and capex requirement is also quite high for a h2 dri plant if you want to put in your premises then you require about 750 dollars per ton of crude steel so these are the few challenges which is there in doubts of achieving the net neutrality okay this slide is a bit uh, bit uh, and also i'm sorry there is such i'll go to the sorry it is a bit misplaced i have to just give me a second please okay uh okay so uh this is a, a little bit busy slide uh, so i'll i'll just explain it to you uh, slowly uh, what happens here is that in this particular case we are trying to show that let us say that you have an ex uh, for an example a 10 million ton steel plant and you want to achieve the net neutrality but how do you do it you can't really you have all blast furnaces only you don't have anything else with you so what is the way of doing it okay um so as i was discussing in that case you have to capture 
all the CO2 that is being emitted and you have to convert it into different products. And in order to do that, uh, anybody would like to capture 17 points, almost 18 billion ton per annum of CO2. The total capex requirement will be fifteen billion dollars. The 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 total green electricity requirement will be you know fifty three point four gigawatt, and hydrogen requirement will be two point seven billion ton per annum. You can understand that it's a daunting task for any company. Of course, if you change the route of uh, hydrogen making from hundred percent electrolyzer to something like 50% electrolyzer and 50% from biomass, it's actually very useful. Then you did not capture so much of CO2. Actually, you can reduce the requirement of capturing CO2 by a margin of 50%. Your CapEx requirement will also come down to about $8.8 .8 billion. The requirement of green electricity will also come down from 53 to 15 gigawatts. And the hydrogen requirement will also be less. However, if you do that, then the, the, the through the CCU route, the product you produce that needs to be sold somewhere, right? So, so I'll not go into the details, but we are showing here an example of. The, the methanol production uh, requirement and the use. And you'll see that we'll never be able to sell so much of methanol that we produce through the CCU route. As a result, that route is not to be adopted. If you have to follow only the blast furnace route, you'll never reach the carbon neutrality. However, if you produce it through the DRI route, as is being shown over here, then you would have much less or an easier option. What would be that option? Your capture uh, requirement of capturing of CO2 would be much less, only 2.3 billion ton. And uh, the, the, the CapEx requirement will come down to $5.8 billion. The green electricity requirement will come down to 25.9 gigawatts only. And the hydrogen requirement, requirement will be about 1 billion ton per annum. So the point that we're trying to tell over here is that the route for future carbon neutrality will have to come through the hydrogen-based DRI route. It cannot be only through the carbon sequestration and carbon capture and use. Mm -hmm. However, there is a challenge here because this has to be gradual transition. Okay. Uh, first, the we have to optimize the, the production route, whatever we have currently. And then gradually, probably the blast furnace route has to be converted into different NG or, or, or the or the natural gas based uh, DRI units. And then gradually the hydrogen based DRI units will come. So this particular journey will take time. And most of the companies would not reach to the net neutrality be, be before 2050. Now, if you see that we talk about hydrogen a lot, but hydrogen, the cost of hydrogen will always be a problem. And that problem is depicted over here. Uh, here we are talking about, you, you know, that uh, the, the, uh, the actually the break-even cost of hydrogen in the x-axis and in the y-axis, the, uh, the uh, CO2 tax or the CO2 price. Now, if a country decides that they will have no carbon tax, then to to economically use the hydrogen-based DRI, hydrogen cost has to come down to $1.1 per kg, which is extremely difficult because right now it is $4 to $6. However, if a company uh, decides to impose a $120 carbon price, then the break-even price of hydrogen would come up to a $3.1 per kg which is close to what it is right now. So a country has to decide what carbon tax they want to impose and what technology they want to adopt in order to reduce the price of hydrogen. So this is going to be very important. And by the way, this break-even price would be different, of course, for CCU. That means 
this is something where we are talking about hydrogen use in DRI. If you want to only decarbonize using the CCU route, that means you capture the carbon, put some hydrogen in it, convert it into different alcohols. If you want to do it that way, then even with the $120 carbon tax, your break-even price of hydrogen will be $2.1. And if you do not put any carbon tax, you really can't sustain. Your hydrogen price has to be, you have to have free hydrogen actually, which is not possible, right? So CCU route only without a carbon tax would never give us the carbon neutrality. Okay, so I'll skip this one. Uh, I'll skip this one as well. Now on the production of green hydrogen, we'll just touch upon a few things. Uh, moderator can tell me that how much time I have, please. Am I audible? Yes. Oh, okay, so I, I hope I have 15 minutes, right? Or uh, five, five to six minutes, right? Okay, so uh, so there are three ways uh, that Tata Steel is actually trying to produce green hydrogen. Uh, one is uh, the usual route of electrolyzer, as we all know this route. Uh, as you can see here, that in this case, the carbon footprint, if you have green electricity, would be zero for hydrogen production. The capex is, let us say, 14x uh, dollar per kg of hydrogen. Now, for biomass route, uh, there is, if the price is x, then the net carbon footprint is actually negative. So this is one thing that we want to tell everyone, that there is a very big positive if you use biomass for production of green hydrogen, because not only you come to the neutral, not only you, you actually come up with the green hydrogen, basically it absorbs carbon CO2. There is of course one more technology we are trying, uh, which is called uh, carbon uh, CLC or uh, chemical looping combustion. So uh, the resources required for hydrogen production for let us say through the electrolyzer route for 1 billion ton of hydrogen production per year, you would require 60 terawatt hour of electricity. For bio, in the biomass route, to produce 1 billion ton of hydrogen, you would require 13 billion ton of biomass. The sub India specific numbers are also written here because there's a lot of uh, uh, crop, that crop residue which is available in India, and we can actually do that. Uh, there is, of course, uh, different gases that uh, steel mill produces can also be converted into hydrogen. Now, I'll just touch upon two very interesting ways of uh, uh, technologies where we are generating hydrogen through the biomass. I'll not go into the details here. Uh, there is a company called Polycrack with whom we are working uh, uh, with for this conversion of uh, municipal solid waste and uh, the biomass into uh, hydrogen uh, gas or, or the seed gas. And this has got actually three different sections. One is a uh, catalogic unit, the catalytic converter, and the multi-state multi, uh, multi separator. So the feed comes to the uh, catalogic unit, actually. It produces some char, which is also very useful because this is biochar. Then the catalytic converter actually produces a mixture of different gases. Okay, And that gas then goes through a conversion uh, or a catalytic process and become hydrogen and CO mixture. Uh, there is a multi state separator, of course, is also there, which separates out the CO and the hydrogen gas from the other gases. Now, this particular process is overall carbon negative because if you use one kg of biomass, then you absorb already about two kg of uh, CO2, which is great in terms of uh, this total CO2 reduction. Uh, then, uh, you know, I'll just touch upon uh, the, the way their carbon capture and utilization is being tried. So there are two ways, let us say methanol, methanol production, if we take as an example, then uh, about 0.14 billion ton of hydrogen would be required to convert 1 billion ton of CO2, and that will give us 0.72 billion ton of uh, methanol, actually. Uh, in the ethanol production, 
you would one would require about 0.23 million ton of hydrogen and uh, 0.64 million ton of CO, which would mix up with the 1 million ton of uh, CO2 and produce about 1 million ton of uh, ethanol. Now, both these can be used to, sub to substitute uh, the petrol or the gasoline in the uh, for for automobiles, and that saves quite a lot of CO2 uh, in the in the process. A very interesting process that you know our researchers in Tata Steel are developing, where a catalytic conversion process is used to convert the CO2 into different polycarbonates. So there is a lot of research done to uh, basically convert or, or create a catalyst, which is a melamine-based catalyst, and it actually actually made up, uh, actually gives a, a CNN uh, based poly polymer and that polymer actually helps in absorbing the CO2. What happens is that different type of epoxies like it is put over here that reacts with the CO2 in presence of this catalyst and make uh, you know different carbonates. And these carbonates later it could be you know ethylene carbonate, it could be uh, uh, for instance the propylene carbonate etc. And those goes through another process and uh, linear carbonates are made. So this has got a lot of use as you can see here, the uses are, sorry, are shown over here. However, there's a challenge. The challenge is that the requirement of this material is limited. So even if you make a lot of polycarbonate, you need to understand that what is the market, how you sell it. But apart from that, the scientific interest here is, is big. And the catalyst that has been developed is is basically first in the world and it's giving a lot of good results. Uh, just one more slide and then I'll finish over here. So we talk about uh, the carbon capture and utilization and maybe production of some uh, chemicals like methanol and substitute it uh, to the uh, with the gasoline and, and reduce CO2 emission uh, when, uh, in the automobile sector. What is the understanding we need to go through that once? So let us say in steel making, there is a blast furnace that emits uh, CO2 and which is put over here as, as let us say, uh, E4. And we have a carbon capture unit which captures this CO2 that is emitted by the blast furnace. Now, what is the total carbon footprint here? The carbon footprint would be because E4 would be minus because you are actually taking that CO2 out of the atmosphere. But in the process, uh, you, are, you are actually running a process. So you'll also generate some CO2 like E1. Then you have to produce some green hydrogen. Let us say the footprint of that is E2. If you have, of course, green, green electricity, you don't have this E2, but let us say that some uh, CO2 footprint will be there. Then you have to take these two, go through a catalytic conversion process, make the methanol. And that methanol uh, production footprint would be E3. So the, what is the total footprint over here is E1 plus E2 plus E3 and minus E4 because you have already absorbed that CO2. But there is a catch that if this methanol is now being used in the fuel, then when you burn the fuel, then this E4 will come out. So then what will happen here? So the captured CO2 from the blast furnace is actually getting emitted. But there is another uh, minus, delta minus, which is happening. That will come over here because the mixed gasoline emission will be lesser than the pure gasoline. So then if you see the equation here, so that will be E1, which is the footprint for CO2 capture, E2, which is the footprint of hydrogen production, E3, which is the footprint of methanol production. Of course, E4, which you captured, is already coming out, but there is a minus delta E, which is you are getting because of the replacement of some percentage of gasoline with this methanol. And the overall, this formula has to be negative. And how do you do that? It is not really through one process, but you have to improve the efficiency of amine, which actually absorbs the CO2. The green hydrogen production has to be such that you really don't produce any, any CO2 during the process. And there, the biomass process actually is helpful because this E2 there is negative. 
for electrolyzer route, the E2 is zero. And the improve the efficiency of the catalyst again to convert the the uh, the mixture of CO2 and hydrogen into into methanol. So there's a lot of work being done over here as well. And E4, which is the emission from the blast furnace, can be reduced by choosing less polluting iron making processes. So if you do those all together, then this quantity over here would be negative. And this is what should be the direction for the carbon capture and utilization. I'll not go to this example anymore. Uh, I'll just uh, touch upon a few challenges uh, for hydrogen utilization here. As we discussed, the hydrogen generation uh, is has to be done at a at a commercially viable cost. High energy intensity per kg of hydrogen generation is of course there. So need to be we need to take care of that. The scale of hydrogen generation, transportation and storage, because scale is quite large, so we have to do that. Transportation is also going to be very important. And there, of course, we need to produce uh, you know steel, which can carry hydrogen without much of embittlement. The scale up of technology, the development of high capacity hydrogen based DRI modules are essential. Uh, the, of course, the high capex for asset replacement is already there and we have discussed about it. So just the uh, concluding remarks from my side, uh, the heavy industry like steel needs a large quantity of hydrogen to mitigate CO2 problem. So that's one big challenge for us. The hydrogen required in this process need to be pure, uh, need to be pure, but need not be green. Need not be pure, I'm sorry. That means that you really go, don't go for fuel cell gate hydrogen. You did not have 99.999% pure hydrogen. You can actually go for slightly impure hydrogen uh, with maybe some CO gas mixed in it. And we don't mind actually. The steel, build, uh, steel makers will not mind, but it has to be green, of course. Scale up is the major focus at this moment because you know we do have some processes in the lab or in the pilot, but the scale up is still yet to happen. Use of biomass and use of steel plant off gases will be in the focus. Although we only talk about the electrolyzers nowadays, but biomass is going to play a big, big role in uh, bringing the net neutrality, not only in the steel industry, but also in other areas. Capturing CO2 and making useful products out of it would be extremely essential. And we just discussed what is necessary. Basically, a lot of research has to happen in the area of cat catalysts. As I was mentioning, the need of catalyst or membrane technologies to separate out nitrogen from mixed gases and convert CO2 to useful products will be the focus of the study. So with that, uh, uh, my technical part of the talk has already ended. I, I must say that this is the work being done by, by my team in Tata Steel. Dr. Sarkar, Samik, uh, Orijit, Santanu, Sojan, Pritesh, and Chalamuri are the people who are uh, really working together and you know bringing this uh, to a reality. Uh, just before I finish, so because we are celebrating Harry's uh, retirement here, so just two memories from my side. Harry already told me that the talk has to be technical, so I have to do that, you know. So, you know, left-hand side is my first encounter with Harry, which happened in the year 2003 in ISC Bangalore. I was traveling uh, from, I think I traveled from Calcutta. I met him over there. He was having a sabbatical uh, there, actually. And, you know, in the right-hand side, you can see Harry not only did metallurgy, but Harry here seen as, uh, you know, cleaning the lab. And thank you, everyone, for uh, listening to this. And if there is any question, I'm thank, you. thank you, Shura. Thank you for a very interesting talk. It's very uh, timely with uh, all these ecological problems. I have just a couple of comments, then we can pass the questions to the floor. I think first we should separate iron making and steel making. I understand that most of the steel producers are integrated and they also operate blast furnaces. There are still some that only use scrap, and those have like uh, times 10 less of CO2 pollutions than when operating blast furnace. And the other one is the CAPEX investment. Uh, I was uh, just uh, reading last time in Financial Times, uh, Thyssen Group in Duisburg, 
they want to operate a smaller plant uh, to produce uh, direct reduced iron with hydrogen and only hydrogen investment need to be in the uh, in the ballpark of 10 billion dollars so can you comment on all these uh, costs and how we can then actually produce the green steel if we can't even produce the green electricity at the moment as you see in europe now uh, with the price of electricity goes so up everybody fired up all the coal powered power plants true to i yeah very correct in fact and you can understand that uh, there are problems uh, in this actually the capex requirement or the investment requirement is huge and you have rightly pointed out the 10 billion dollar uh, uh, number which has come into the into the into the notice of every one of us and actually the europe the way things are happening i think the government is also helping the companies uh, you know to invest in the green technologies or sometimes they are imposing some taxes co2 taxes and i was i was uh, i was just uh, mentioning that how the co2 tax can reduce the break even cost of hydrogen so that these policies needs to be in place and the policies would actually help us not only the technology it is also policies which are going to help us in achieving the net zero or the net neutrality in steel industry now about your comment on the on the uh, on use of scrap root of steel making where you just need the scrap and, and nothing else so there are a few reservations so what is of course there are companies like vas alpine who are already using a lot of scrap in their normal processes and mini mills are going to come where the more and more scrap would be used but the availability of quality scrap is something that is not available everywhere in europe it is there in india for instance it is not there so if we have to adopt in india that route we really have to go for steel which is not going to be as good in quality it is through the normal route of steel making for instance you know this 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 scrap will have elements like copper in it it will have elements like molybdenum in it and you can't really afford to have such stress elements in certain high grade steels like automotive or api so you can have construction steels probably through that route very easily but if you are talking about producing very high quality steel or to exterior or even any any auto grade with high strength or api grades line pipe grade steels you might not have the quality that you want there are processes which talks about uh, you, you know taking care of those problems uh, in the steel making uh, through the electric arc furnace route and uh, but these are still we need to need to need to wait and see how the technology unfolds nitrogen uh, the overall nitrogen content in the steel will also be a problem in the 100% scrap route because in ef steel making you have generally high concentration of nitrogen which is not acceptable for automotive grades so these okay. are the challenges yeah yeah yes thank you uh, we have uh, you. one question from the chat uh, which doesn't talk uh, more to the talk but it's uh, more talking about EU innovation. Fabio Miani is asking, uh, which is your opinion of the EU large-scale innovation fund? This steel plant for direct uh, reduce uh, iron in Sweden, hybrid, has won the first uh, round call, but there will be other large-scale calls in March next year. So it talks about this without government support, uh, steel producers will not be able basically to convert to clean steel yeah yeah in fact i i also mentioned that in fact as i said that the government support and the policies are very important in this only the steel makers only the innovations will not really be enough and that is true for europe it is true for china it is true for india and everywhere uh, there are, there is a certain a very ambitious projects coming up even in the middle east actually uh, where there is uh, discussions going on to make a, a city which is completely green for instance that city is made with steel which is completely green steel because they probably have a lot of uh, sources of uh, solar energy and wind energy which can help them in producing the uh, green hydrogen but 
even that would require uh, support from the government and uh, policies in place in order to make it uh, economically viable. Yeah, that's why in hybrid, uh, Waterfall is involved, which is basically Sweden uh, National Electricity Company. We have right. Another, right. another question uh, from Antonio Sergio. Uh, if you can please unmute him. Yes, um, hello. I don't know if you are seeing me now. Um, I work here in Brazil in a steel plant that uh, produces uh, pipes for all the sectors, oil and gas, automotive, and so on. And since the beginning, here the option from the, say, world business was to use bio charcoal. So, and we produce uh, this charcoal by planting forest, a huge amount of forest of eucalyptus. And every seven years, we cut the trees and generate the bio charcoal. And the BF is charged with 100% of bio charcoal, not with coke. And in this sense, we have a positive balance of generating O2 instead of uh, CO2. So we can say that we have really a green steel using in the matrix yeah, the, the bio charcoal instead of coke. And uh, we have also a EIF in our, in our steel plant when we can use also the scrap. And the energy in Brazil is most of it is generated by the hydraulic power station that is, is green in, in its source. Yeah? It's not uh, really uh, needed to, to use hydrogen to produce electricity and then use this electricity in the, in the steel making process. India directly has also a huge, uh, say, amount of, uh, say, land to plant forests. Tata has not thought about this possibility, also to generate, say, bio charcoal and use the bio charcoal in the blast furnace. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Antonio, thanks for raising this. In fact, that's a hot topic in Tata Steel right now. So, what we are doing, I just tell you. Uh, so, in the area where our company is located, the state is called Jharkhand, and that particular state has a particular uh, plant which is a typical type of a bamboo plantation, okay? And we were quite interested to understand whether that bamboo would be useful for production of biochar coal, as you are mentioning. So we have collected, you know, seven different uh, types of these uh, species, and we found two of them actually extremely, extremely good for uh, production of biochar coal, biochar, biochar coal. And because that has uh, ash content less than 1.3%. And we actually generating, uh, we are working with one of our partners in Australia with whom we are generating a process of pyrolysis to convert this bamboo into different uh, type of charcoals. And then we are actually testing those charcoals now to see whether this can replace the PCI injection in the blast furnace. And uh, of course, that's that's kind of a that's kind of a work in progress, but the but the quality and the uh, and, and the and the characteristics of the charcoal that we have produced now with the new process that we are working on, is absolutely spot on for to replace the PCI injection in, in the blast furnace. Now the second part, what you are talking about, is of course uh, land and cultivation. Uh, now I must say that uh, land is there, but uh, using this we have to as and this is where the the help of the government of course would be necessary because you need to take that land from the government and plant this we have a department which is uh, which is corporate social Res responsibility department csr we call it they are in working with the government agencies and try and understand the whether we can take the whole project as a social project rather than a, a technology project basically because those bamboos can be uh, actually grown by the locals and uh, those can be purchased later by by the companies like us and convert it into useful products and use it the in the steel value chain and reduce the reduce the co2 footprint so your your uh, your suggestion and your uh, the information that you give is very very encouraging and we are actually working towards that okay. thank you for the question and answer 
I think we can talk about this whole afternoon, but we need to move on.